Good morning. This is Mike DeLaCluse. Uh, we, it's 9 o'clock. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I am the president of Lesterman Instrument Company and would like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for uh, choosing the proper process valve to reduce operating costs, also known as uh, an explanation of the difference between linear globe valves and rotary control valves. Uh, today our speaker is uh, Gordon Sanderson. Uh, and he's going to uh, be the speaker on the topic. He's going to talk about how the proper selection can make your process better and cost less to operate. In our 45-minute webinar, Gordon is going to cover some basic explanations of linear control, linear globe valves versus rotary control valves, some advantages and disadvantages of the valve types. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the cost of ownership factors some application success stories, and then uh, we'll open it up to question and answer. Uh, Gordon is DeSerk's Western Regional Manager for Industrial Products. He has more than 28 years of engineering experience, serving as an application engineer, a mining engineer, and a field engineer before joining DeSerk in 2015. He has a, a Bachelor of Science degree in Manufacturing Engineering from uh, Brigham Young University. We welcome Gordon as our featured speaker for October and November. We're going to continue our valve discussion in November and thank him for sharing his knowledge during this exclusive session for our customers. We will be muting the phone lines. If you have any questions, there is a question tool built into GoToWebinar and I will be watching that tool and making sure that your questions get answered. So just type them into the tool and we'll get you taken care of. With that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Gordon. Thank you very much, Mike, and good morning to everybody. Uh, again, my name is Gordon Sanderson. I reside in Utah, and I'm, ta I'm speaking to you from my office in Salem, Utah, which is about oh, 20 miles south of Provo, about an hour south of Salt Lake City. As Mike introduced me, um, we're going to, I'm going to be talking about the, the, the Desert's rotary control valve, or what we call the RCV. Um, it's in a class of valves that you may already be familiar with. If you're familiar with the Camflex, uh, the Mason Young Camflex and the V500, this is the type of control valve that I'm going to be discussing today. Desert's uh, product in that class is called the RCV. I'm going to be talking about it versus the globe valve. And this is a this representation here is what I'm going to be talking about in the in, in the 45 minutes that I have with you. The valve on the left is a is a representation of the RCV. Uh, it's it's camming action as you can see as it's rotating. Sometimes they call it an eccentric plug valve, but it is a control valve. And the valve on the right, of course, is a glow valve, and you're familiar with the rising stem uh, action on it. My intention today is not to Oh, lack of a better word, to bash control valves. I've been working with linear control valves all my life, all my career rather, and they do have a, they do play a very important pro, uh, a very important role in process control, and in plants, refineries, oil and gas, uh, LNG. Uh, they they serve a, uh, they serve a very important function. But what I'm going to be talking about is that perhaps select an RCV first uh, before going to a control valve, and I'll tell you the advantages of doing that. This is nothing new. Um, ExxonMobil adopts this practice worldwide in, in most of their refineries. They will go to a, an eccentric control valve or a camming control valve like a Camflex or a V500 first in their plants before they, before they install a glow valve, and these are the reasons why. There's more valve capacity per valve size, or there's more capacity per valve size. Uh, this is a really important one. There's better packing life than a liter packing box on a globe. Uh, the packing just lasts longer. And it has pretty good recovery in moderate pressure drop situations. <clears throat> Excuse me. What I'd like to talk to, what, how I'd like to address this is an experience that I had while I was commissioning a plant all about three years ago. The plant that you're looking at right here is the Long Harbor Mine, uh, located in Newfoundland, Canada. It's a nickel mine. It's located about, oh, 
70 miles to the east of St. John's. Uh, it's a, they use autoclave technology to process the ore and going out the door or, or going to, to market our nickel billets. When they commissioned this plant, um, I got a, I, I got a phone call from the process engineer. <clears throat> And she said, Gordon, we're going to have a challenge when we start up. We're not going to be able to go to full capacity right at first. As a matter of fact, in year one, we're going to be at 25% capacity. Year two, we're going to be at 60% capacity going all the way through year four. Year four, we'll be at about 100% capacity. So if schedule is, if they, if they did maintain that schedule, about today is when they are going to be full capacity. So they came to me and they said, with the valves that you've engineered for us, Gordon, are we going to be okay? Now, the valves that I did, that I was responsible for, were some very critical valves uh, in the plant. One was called the autoclave level control valve, or what they call the LCV. And these valves are very critical. They maintain the level in the autoclave in the plant. And at 25% of capacity, that was a concern. <clears throat> and so we did a lot of engineering a lot of analysis beforehand to make sure that the valve was going to be performing its function at year one, year two, year three, and year four. The other valves in the plant are, are auxiliary steam, water, etc. And so I can only imagine, I know I was not involved with these valves, but I can imagine the challenges that they must have had as well, particularly the auxiliary steam. And so what I'm going to be sharing with you is perhaps some of the things that they were going through with the provide with about with the control valve providers that were, uh, of the auxiliary steam and the water. So let's assume that they did have globe control valves in there. So again, they uh, they would have come to that engineer, or that engineer would have gone to the to the providers of the globe valves, and they said, and they would have said, year one we're going to be at 25 percent, year two at 60, all the way through year four, which will finally be at 100 percent. Now, what we'll assume is that the valves, the control valves in there were sized with full area trims. And so the valve that you see on the right, I selected a three inch glow valve. And its full area trim is trim number 2.62, or that would be the orifice size, which has a CV of about 104. So at year one, let's say the steam flow or the, or the auxiliary steam for the autoclave would have, been, would have required this trim right here. This would have been a trim number 1.0. This, this is a full three reduction trim set that would have been required for this valve, and it has a CV of 31. Now, changing out the trims on a globe valve can be very labor intensive, and it can be expensive. So to get a CV of 31 for 25% capacity in the plant would have required a new, a new valve seat and a new plug, and perhaps a new actuator because the stroke length changes on the smaller trims. And then at year two, you would have another trim set. And then in the year three, another trim set. Now to change out the trims on this linear glow valve, it's, as I said, it, it can be very labor intensive. You have to undo the body bolts or the bonnet bolts. You have to remove the actuator. You're gonna have to change out your gaskets and chances are you're gonna have to change your packing particularly if it's graphite packing, as it would probably would be in steam service. And then if you do have to modify the actuator, that's even more work associated with that. With the skills and experience that I've had, it, it would take about, oh, two and a half hours per valve to do all of that change. Now, if, if RCVs were installed in its place, Instead of the glow valves, this is what we this is what we were look this is what we, we would look at. Now these are the trim reductions in an RCV. We have 0.2 trim, 0.5 trim, full and high, and the corresponding CVs 30, 75, 150, and 185. So for year one, that's what would that's what you would have to do to the RCV. You would install that trim. Year two, you would have to install that, and then so on until you're at the full capacity trim or for the or what the about or what the plan is rated for at full at full rate. So what you're looking at here is much less expensive than having to change a plug and a seat. And 
much less labor intensive to change these out as well. I'll demonstrate later on how easy it is to change out the trim on the RCV. But sufficient to say right now, it's simply removing the, the seat retainer, pulling out the old seat, and dropping in the new seat. <clears throat> so to that regard, let me talk about the other valves that are in the class of the RCV. I mentioned that there is the cam flex and there is the V500. They both have the same camming or the eccentric action of the RCV. But there are differences between the RCV and these, and these valves that I'm going to be showing you next. <clears throat> One of the big advantages of the RCV is that it does have the clamped in retainer. This is what makes the, this is what makes changing out trim so easy. As compared to the other valves in its class, they have a threaded in retainer. Now having worked on these valves at, at various times in my career, that do have a threaded in retainer, removing that retainer can be very labor intensive, particularly after it's been in service for a while. It often requires a special tool to get it out. Whereas with the RCV, it is clamped in, <clears throat> excuse me, or it's held in by the pipe flange. Another big uh, difficult thing with the other with the other valves in the in the RCV class is that shims are required. Shims are required in order to get the class of shutoff that, you, that is desired. Most of the time, it's a class four shutoff. Now, these shims, as you, as you can see in the picture right here, they're nothing more than, than hoops, metal hoops with varying thicknesses. And so the valve assembler will then drop a pair of hoops in there, stroke the valve, and if it's not stroking correctly, he'll then put in another set of hoops. It's trial and error until he gets it right. The RCV does not use shims. It has an orbital seat. This is one of the, this is one of the designs that Zurich has implemented with this valve. All you have to do is drop that seat in there. It self aligns with a plug and you get class four shutoff. No shims are required. And of course you have the four trim sets per valve size on every RCV that are easy to change out and put in. So in that scenario that I just told you about where we're going, where the plant is, is being started up and they're not gonna be at full capacity during commissioning, changing out these trims to, to get the valve to stroke at, a pro, at the ideal stroke rotation in this case, you want the valve at uh, during normal flow to be operating at about 60% capacity, it's easy to do with the RCV. Another advantage of the RCV <clears throat> is that other valves in its class have what they call a crossover shaft, meaning that the shaft goes all the way through the plug into a journal on the, uh, on the end of the valve body. That's what keeps it secure and in place. Now this crossover shaft is when the valve is open, the crossover shaft is always in the flow stream. This can be a challenge on the smaller valves in particular because it, it starves the valve of capacity. So there's no advantage of using this valve versus a linear valve. However, on the RCV, it has a clear flow path. <clears throat> In other words, the, 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 the shaft does not go all the way through across the, uh, across the back side of the plug and into the, into the bottom journal of the valley, or excuse me, of the valve. So the valve, when the valve is open, it is clear going all the way through. This is of particular importance, especially if you're, uh, if you're throttling slurry. You don't want anything to be in that flow path or anything, to, anything that could build up on the shaft. Now another great, another great reason, and one of, in particular why Exxon likes the RC, likes this class of valve versus a globe, is this, what I'm gonna be showing you right here. Now we're looking at a three inch RCV versus a three inch globe. If you look at, if you compare the CVs of both of these valves, which I have them one on top of the other, the blue pertains to the RCV and the pink on the bottom pertains to the globe. You can see at a 0.2 trim, which is the full reduction of the three inch RCV compared to the 1.0 trim compared to the globe valve underneath, the CVs are relatively the same. 
But when you get up to a half inch trim, you can see that the RCV starts to pull away. You have a CV of 75 versus 52. You have a CV of 150 versus 78, which I have there in the, in the black box. And then for the high trim, you have a CV of 185 versus 104. In this scenario, let's say we have a Schedule 40 pipe, 4 inch, and the CV required for this process is a CV of 130. You can see that on a 3 inch glow valve, we're simply not going to make it because the highest trim capacity available on the 3 inch glow valve has a CV of 104. But with full area trim on the, or what we call full trim on the RCV, it would do just fine. So here there could be a, a very significant a very significant cost savings. In the four inch line, you can actually use a three inch RCV and you'd have more than enough capacity to handle it. But here in this case, there's not enough capacity for a line size glow valve to handle the CV of 130. It can be a significant cost savings if you look at the RCV in this regard as well. Another advantage of the RCV is that it has excellent control. The friction is very low, simply because as you look at the, uh, the camming action at the top right, it has very little breakout torque, if any at all, and it freely rotates inside the valve body. And so you're going to get very smooth and very fluid rotation of that plug. And the hysteresis and, de and dead band is very, very favorable. It has a repeatable throttling accuracy of plus or minus a half a percent over the entire range. And there's a reason why it, and there's a reason why it's, it's such. One is the camming action of the plug. And number two is the, uh, is that the, the plug is splined and pinned to the shaft. So there's no slop. There's no movement and it's very secure, where the others use a square, um, they use a square shaft and a square, a square hole, if you will, in their, in their plug, and it does create some slop. Another is the coupling assembly. This is where the RCV actually attaches to the actuator. This is a really unique, uh, this is a really unique advantage that Zurich has with their with our rotary actuators. If I flip, so what we're looking at is this coupling that you see right here inside the actuator where the, the shaft of the RCV mates with the, uh, with the housing. The shaft is actually inserted inside this coupling right here. But before I explain this further, you flip this over and this is, basic, this is where the RCV will be inserted or the, or the shaft of the RCV will, will be inserted into the actuator. Now, what you're seeing here on the left, it may look simply, that's just a square hole. But what Zurich has done is that they've made this coupling to be equipped with two clamps. These clamp, now, when the clamps are loose, and these are socket head cap screws, the hole that you see on the left is clearly what you see. The square shaft is inserted, or the body subassembly is inserted, and then you torque down those two clamps, and then it grips. And it, comp and it compressively holds that shaft into place, thereby eliminating all slop or backlash. So the camming action that, I, that I've showed you earlier, the splined and pinned shaft inside the valve body, as well as these two clamps and the coupling to the actuator, create an extremely accurate control valve. So as a review, what I'd like to do is go to SolidWorks, And, sh and just let you and demonstrate to you some of the principles that we just talked about. Here's the body subassembly of the RCV. Now I demonstrated to you earlier that changing out these trims is very easy. So what I'll do in SolidWorks is I will remove <clears throat> the retainer. And there you can see the what we call the orbital seat. Now these two screws that you see right here are simply there for assembly. It's so that when we ship the valve out, it, um, this is not gonna fall out, if you will. But you remove these before the valve is installed. 
and then you remove the orbital seat and then you're done. And then so if you want to replace a trim of a, an, an orbital seat with a smaller orifice or with a smaller CV, you simply get it and drop it back in. It self-aligns with the plug and then you put the retainer back on and you're finished. Having assembled the other valves that have the, where you have to install shims in order to get the valve to seat correctly, and you have to remove this retainer, which is threaded, it, it, would, it, it could be very difficult, but with the RCV, it's so simple. I'll turn the valve around, <clears throat> and here you can see on the inside, there's no crossover shaft. I'll get in here closer. There's no crossover shaft in here. So when the valve is open, you get a clear flow path going all the way through, which is really critical if you want to make sure that you get all the capacity of the valve that's available. And if you're flowing a slurry, you don't want to have anything in, in the way of the flow stream. And if I take this out and And in here a little bit closer, there's the spline shaft, and it is also pinned, making that a very secure connection with the RC with the with the shaft and the plug. So there's no backlash and there's, and there's no slot. All right. Close this down. Go to the next slide here. Whoops. All right. So why use the RCV as an in review, well, it has a higher CV or capacity per valve size than a globe, and so it could be a significant cost savings in that regard. Uh, you can use a smaller RCV in place of a larger globe, and then there, that is where the dollar savings can be, real, can be realized in a great way. Easier to change trims than a globe valve. One orbital seat, one orbital seat versus having to replace a plug-in seat. And from a maintenance standpoint, it is very, very easy to do. It has excellent control for those reasons that we just discussed. And it has a very good recovery factor. Now, what I'd like to talk to you about now is what that, exactly what that entails. Here's, a, here's what, in, in control valve science, it's called FSABEL. Sometimes we call it recovery. Now, in the, in, in the control valve world, there's nothing as good as a glow valve when it comes to recovery, or meaning its resistance to cavitation. Here you can see on the chart where we have Epsabel on the left and we have percent open on the bottom. A glow valve maintains a very high Epsabel all the way through 10% uh, open through 100% open. But following just beneath that is the RCV, or a valve in its class. It has a, the recovery factor is not as good as the globe, but it maintains its recovery factor through, through, the, through the percent open. Now, the pink, or excuse me, the magenta is a ball valve. You can see when the valve is just cracking open on a ball, on the, uh, on a ball valve, the recovery factor is, is um, it's very respectable, but it drops off significantly as the valve opens up, and it's even worse on a butterfly valve. But there's something that you need to understand with an RCV, and this is what um, I, I believe this is what Exxon has discovered as well. And for that, I'd like to go to this case study. Here we have a, a clearly we have a cavitating situation where the inlet pressure to this control valve is at 347 PSI, the outlet pressure is 100 PSI, the temperature is 100, and this is water, of course. Our flow rate is 500 GPM, and we got three inch schedule 40 pipe. Sizing this globe valve, it requires a CV of 32. Clearly, the valve is cavitating, and so in this situation, we want to, you would want to put in some cavitation control trim and these trims can be very expensive. But if you do your homework, and again, take a look at an RCV, if you install the RCV in this situation, this is what it will look like. With the plug facing the flow, 
it will clearly undergo cavitation damage. Now, what you're looking at in this uh, in this depict in this animation is the cavitation that is forming right here on the plug down there at the bottom, or that is the vapor that's forming and, the, and a subsequent collapsing of the vapor bubbles. That that trim will be damaged if the RCV is installed in that fashion. However, if you install the RCV with the with the, the plug downstream or in this fashion, <clears throat> it's much more favorable and you will not have to use a glow valve in this situation with expensive cavitation trim. Because the F sub L, the recovery factor, is much more favorable with the shaft upstream or with the plug downstream. That's a simple trick that a lot of people in, in the industry that and in my experience that we that we know about and we're careful about using it, but when we can use it, it's a great, it's a uh, it can be a great cost savings. And as I said earlier in my discussion, I don't want to, my objective here is not to bash control valves, but simply to let you know that there are situations where nothing but a glow valve is, gonna, is going to suffice because the cavitation is so extreme, uh, it's, it's, that is what you're going to have to use. But the objective of what I'm talking about today is in your control valve strategy, take a look at an RCV first. And the engineers at Lessman and the engineers at Zurich will take a look at uh, at all the, at all your conditions to make sure that you're going to get the right valve in there for the right uh, uh, for your application, and so that it will last a long time. So it's a strategy to take a look at the RCV first and to see if it will work. It can be a significant cost savings not only up front, but for maintenance reasons down for the life of the for the life of your plant. And it's an alternate approach to control valve selection. And to uh, to put it very succinctly, try it first. It can save you a lot of money and um, it's an excellent control valve. And that's all I have. Very good. Uh, there were some really Interesting illustrations that you had in there that I don't think I'd seen before. Uh, we'll give it a couple minutes and see if we have any questions. Uh, while we're waiting for questions, Gordon, I just want to thank you very much for putting on the presentation. If uh, anybody in the audience does have any specific application questions, uh, feel free to give us a call at 809 Lessman or 800-953-7626. If you're not sure who your account manager is, feel free to just ask for me, Mike DeLaCluse, and I'll make sure that you get taken care of. You can also reach me uh, via email at mikeD at lessman.com. Our next webinar is going to also be presented by Gordon, and will be at 9 a.m. on November 16th. Uh, Gordon is going to talk about solving some difficult valve applications, you know, continuing a little bit that we talked about here in terms of cavitation. Uh, if you do want to know more about the other technologies we supply, please follow us on social media. Uh, Dan Weisey, one of our technical specialists, has a blog. We call it Dan's blog. Uh, it's very active and tons of great uh, tips. All of our webinars are posted both on our website and on our Lessman Instrument Co. YouTube channel. Uh, so if you want to go back and view it, they will be posted. and You can find them both on our website and on YouTube. If there are some topics that you'd like us to cover in a future webinar, please send me an email with the subject. We have access to lots of product managers, lots of pro process specialists. So let me know what you'd like to cover in an email, and we, we'll make sure we get the uh, uh, topic expert for you. At this point, uh, we still don't have any questions coming up, so we will conclude our, our presentation. Again, if you think of one later, feel free to email me, and I'll make sure we get it answered for you. Thank you very much for attending. Gordon, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. You're welcome.